Welcome to Digital Oil and Gas with Jeffrey Can. I'm Jeffrey. Digital Oil and Gas looks at the impact of digital technology on the global oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Can on Twitter or at jeffreycan.com. This podcast is entitled Applying Digital to the Carbon Conundrum Revisited. Most, if not all, large energy companies now include climate change as a critical topic on the board agenda. As managers, you may be wondering what your business can do about it. Well, here's some digital tools that can help. First, let's discuss the dilemma. It's possible to hold two opposite ideas at once and still function. On the one hand, I accept that the science of climate change and that human activity, particularly the burning of fossil fuels, is having an effect on the climate. In 1994, I spent a short two-week vacation on Magnetic Island, which is just offshore of Townsville in North Queensland, and I took a day trip snorkeling on the Great Barrier Reef. I have vivid memories of gigantic clams four feet across, of vast schools of fish, of the constant crunching of parrotfish eating coral, and of lingering after a sea turtle through acres of deep coral fjords. I then visited Cairns on two separate trips in 2003 and again on 2014, with trips to Green Island each time. By 2014, I was staggered at the extent of the coral loss. The ocean floor was gray with dead coral. The color had all gone. The fish population seemed to have diminished to just a few stragglers. The reef is my canary in the coal mine. The current iteration of the reef is about 8,000 years old and developed following the last ice age, and it is now vanishing. It needs hundreds of years to return to its 1994 glory. The next generation of consumers are convinced of climate change, and they're now exercising their choices by protesting, walking out of school, and pressuring universities to divest of fossil investments. Oil executives lament the lack of interest in the industry from their own kids. On the other hand, I also observe that the fossil fuel industry has been instrumental in bringing prosperity to much human existence by bringing light to the dark, heat to the cold, and force to the inert. From 1993 to 1995, I worked regularly in China, and my photos from that time are very revealing. Blue skies, bicycles everywhere, no cars, no streetlights, and door-to-door coal delivery by donkey cart. Coal, plus iron ore, plus oil, has lifted 500 million people out of poverty by rapidly improving the performance of the agriculture, transportation, and manufacturing sectors. Another 500 million people await their opportunity to enter the middle class, but perhaps at the expense of irreversible damage to our earthly Garden of Eden. I hold these two conflicting ideas at the same time that the very thing that has lifted us into prosperity, comfort, and flourishing is also threatening the climate. There are a number of progress blockers. Businesses everywhere are, or will be, tasked with figuring out a new balance between our use of energy, the economies that power our lifestyles, and our impact on the natural environment. The triple E, or EEE for short. Societies are now woke to the balancing act of the triple E. During the pandemic, economies suffered hugely, energy demand tumbled, while in the environment the skies became bluer and the water clearer. Assume that the environment is the reactive participant in this trio. The environment reacts to how we create and use energy and how our economies consume our resources to sustain our lifestyles. It falls to humans to manage proactively the energy and the economy element of the triple E. According to a Dr. Asim Prakash of the University of Washington, there are four challenges that society faces as it aims for this new balance. Number one is the tragedy of the commons. The cost of making changes to our energy use or to our economies through regulation or taxation are localized to specific jurisdictions but the benefits accrue globally beyond our borders. GHGs inconsiderately ignore national borders, 
We can clean our air in Canada, but what's the point if China doesn't follow suit? Number two is the fairness equation. The consequences of choices in energy use, or how our economies operate, penalizes some segments of society while benefiting others. We can tax fossil fuels to encourage energy diversification, but that penalizes construction workers who are entirely dependent on diesel fuel for their equipment and for whom alternative equipment simply doesn't exist. Three is flagrant hypocrisy. We signal how virtuous we are as we recycle or we embrace the 100-mile diet while we strive to live in splendid pandemic isolation in our new large monster homes and drive our Ford F-150s to buy groceries. Serious climate change must be someone else's problem. And four is the agency perception. We tell ourselves that any personal contribution we make to solve the climate problem just doesn't matter because tiny changes are irrelevant. China emits the same quantity of GHG as Canada every 25 days. Cut your business GHG emissions by 50% and so what? Well, what can we do? The actors in the Triple E equation have limited levers to pull to drive change, and here's just a few to consider. Governments. To change social behaviors in an economy or in energy use, governments can create a price signal by imposing a carbon tax, or implementing a cap-and-trade market, or by regulating for emissions. Non-governmental organization moves. To maintain pressure on the other actors, NGOs or non-government organizations can maintain registries of big emitters, conduct name-and-shame campaigns, pressure investors to decarbonize their portfolios, intervene in energy and economic proposals, and litigate for change. Third are business changes. Businesses can embrace carbon pricing, adopt carbon accounting alongside other measurements, implement voluntary greening programs, and transform their supply chains. Financial institutions can withdraw funding for fossil fuels. Universities can discontinue their education programs in the petroleum studies and emphasize renewables instead. And lastly, personal actions. What about the rest of us? Well, we're encouraged to go vegetarian as meat is one of the most egregious carbon sources, adopt electric transportation if it's available, put solar panels on your house if you happen to have an idle $15,000 that might never pay off, fly less, no more sunny holidays, and put on a sweater. The digital response. Well, in the race between fossil fuels and technology, technology is going to win. Technology is surfing Moore's Law of Exponential Improvements while fossil fuel energy plods along with marginal gains. Eventually, as technology is applied to the Triple E challenges, it's going to find some winning solutions. And so here are the levers for carbon management that are highly susceptible to digital innovation. Number one is emissions tracking. If you're in industry, you've seen those annoying inspirational posters on meeting room walls with a bracing picture of a racing yacht or a pit crew, underwritten with some syrupy business truth about measuring things. You know, what gets measured gets rewarded. You can't fix what you can't measure. In God we trust, everyone else bring data. Subjectivity measures nothing consistently. And if you can't measure it, it's not love. None of the standard energy SCADA systems of the past were designed for emissions tracking. Emissions were not a thing. Adding an army of expensive engineering talent or management accounting people to measure emissions is not plausible for many companies and industries. This is a job for automation, the Internet of Things, and analytics. Number two, carbon trading and carbon credit tracking. Inventing credits for carbon emitted and not emitted, pricing those credits, enabling the trading of credits, only an economist could come up with such an elegant answer that combines everything you don't understand about cryptocurrency and NFTs with everything you don't understand about greenhouse gas. Blockchain could be the solution to uniquely identify a carbon credit so that it is not counted twice and manages the credit through its life cycle of purchase, sale, exchange, and disposal. Number three is working from wherever. I was on a call recently with a conference organizer who is putting together his first live event in over two years. 
Like me, he has worked through the pandemic without needing a suit and tie, pressed shirts, and even shoes. For a big segment of society, going back to the office grind of commuting, overly engineered schedules, expensive clothes, and cosmetics is suddenly very unappealing. Cloud computing, encryption tools, collaboration technologies, gamification, augmented reality, AI, and other digital tools showed the world that many workers can work from wherever they happen to be rather than in the office of the past. Next is the automation of equipment. There's a lot of driving around in oil and gas because the assets in the industry are spread out. Just for fun, use Google Earth to zero in on Odessa, Texas, and check out all the oil wells far from civilization. The industry really needs smarter assets that self-manage, using the data from their own sensors and interpreted by their onboard artificial intelligence engines. This will trim the requirement for people to drive long distances, which is, after all, a carbon-intense activity, to simply visually inspect the equipment, or maybe check a few of fluid level, or record some data from gauges, or, and and most importantly, carry out some maintenance. And then there's supply chain greening. I've been involved in hundreds of supply chain businesses, and in the past, carbon has rarely, if ever, factored into any thinking about the design of the supply chain. The pandemic has shown just how delicate and sensitive our global supply chains are to disruptions. It's been reported that ship transits from China to the U.S. are now over 114 days versus 65 before the pandemic. Additive manufacturing will be one of the key digital tools that helps industry rethink the supply chain with uh, design, but with carbon in mind. Now, there are some lower impact levers that uh, carbon management uh, can uh, lever. These aren't as susceptible to digital innovation, and, but they, they may be addressed using other existing tools. Consider carbon accounting. With a handle on actual emissions, the next step is to account for the emissions, the volumes, the intensity, the timing, the source activities. The accounting enables the accountability, or the pressure on someone to act on the accounting. The business gene for making things better kicks in with plans, budgets, targets, timetables, penalties, and rewards. All of these, of course, are presently available in abundance in most businesses. And then carbon pricing. A sure way to get managers to pay attention to something is to give it a cost. They can then weigh up whether to invest to yield the best cost or productivity outcome. Managers don't need a real carbon price to take action. They can equally use a phantom price or a shadow price. And then finally, what you can do is just lower the thermometer and put on a sweater. So in conclusion, the Triple E formula has been drifting out of balance now for decades. More than ever, we need to turn to technology to help us strike a more sustainable balance.